Hi friends, welcome to this morning's Blue Water Church service. We're so pleased that you could join us today. If you happen to be watching the premiere on Sunday morning, go ahead and say hi in the live chat. Leave your comments there. We would love to have a conversation with you in that live chat next to the, uh, the video screen on. I can never figure this out. It's on the side of the screen somewhere. You know where it is. And of course, if you're watching some other time during the week, welcome to you as well. We're so happy that you're tracking with us. This week, I think, has been a pretty good week for us as a church, largely because the COVID restrictions in our municipality are beginning to ease up a little bit. And we were able to open our ministry space, which we call The Bridge, downtown King Carden. The drop-in was able to be open and running on Monday, which was wonderful. There are a lot of people in the community who were missing that while we were in uh, lockdown. And the moorings who normally meet in person were able to meet again in the evenings at the bridge. And so it's just been really nice to have a week where, uh, you know, things are still kind of awkward. We have some restrictions we need to follow, but it's been good to see each other face to face again. Today, we are continuing our current teaching series called Daring Greatly. And in that series, we are learning more about what it means for each of us to actually participate in and be engaged in building the kingdom of Jesus right here in our midst. So if you have a Bible somewhere in your house, now would be a great time to have that open to Matthew chapter 25. Chris is going to walk us through a parable in Matthew chapter 25. So open it to that chapter and just set it aside so we can refer to that in the teaching portion of this morning's service. And during our service last Sunday, Jonathan Farrell, our board chair, gave us a brief introduction to the board members on our new official board of directors. And then after that, I mentioned that there is, uh, there was a decision made at last month's board meeting and I got to share some exciting news with you. And um, I said that I would share that this morning. And as uh, Francis, my beloved husband, and I were watching last Sunday's service, he called me a huge jerk for keeping everybody in suspense for a whole week. So I hope that the week has not been too agonizing for you as you've sat on the edge of your seat waiting for this exciting news, which I, I honestly am just so, so happy to share with you, which is this. Um, starting in May, Blue Water will be employing our very own Summer Flow Intern. Yay! Um, for those of you who don't know or maybe just need a refresher, Flow is an internship program that's offered through our denomination, the Be in Christ Church of Canada, or BIC, as we often refer to it. And Flow is designed to equip and develop leaders uh, between the ages of 18 and 25. And there's also going to be a link to the, the Flow webpage on the BIC website uh, that's listed right below this video if you want to click on that and uh, read a little bit more about it. Many of you will have met the director of the Flow Internship Program. Her name is Melanie Wig, and she came as a guest speaker to Blue Water Church just over a year ago. And Melanie does an excellent job running and organizing the Flow Internship Program. This will be the second intern that Blue Water has had. And um, the first one was in 2018. That was during our move from meeting as a church at the Davidson Center in King Carden into the bridge at 746 Queen Street, downtown King Carden. And uh, that intern was me. It was uh, honestly, such a wonderful experience. Just speaking personally, I barely know where to start. There's so many things about the program that are just incredible and helpful, both for the intern um, and for the, the ministry church space that's hiring the intern as well. Um, I grew 
in relationship with Jesus. I grew uh, in relationship with a cohort of other interns as we learned together. I also learned a lot about myself, about um, who I am, what are my strengths and my weaknesses. And a big thing for me is just learning that I actually have uh, a voice, I have things to say, and I have something worth offering to a team and to a church family. Uh, and everybody does, but sometimes it takes us a little bit longer to actually learn that and so flow was a big part of that for me um and then it i also grew in appreciation for our denomination the bic and the way that they invest in developing the next generation and of course a big perk to the internship is this idea of of mentorship and working on a team with some really great people and of course, for me, um, being mentored by Chris has been invaluable in my life. And then finally, just again on a personal note, um, I fell in love with Blue Water Church, the, the family that we have here in a way that has really stuck with me since that point and gripped me ever since then. But enough about me and enough of a preamble, I'm going to informally introduce to you now for the first time our 2021 flow intern her name is laura beth laura beth lives in waterloo and she's going to be working remotely this summer as she creates these sunday morning uh, church services the videos for these services online and then also helps us to upgrade and streamline that video making process so there's a good chance that Laura Beth is watching this video at some point during the week. And if that's the case, welcome Laura Beth. We can't wait to formally welcome you to our Blue Water Church family and uh, to partner with you as you journey with God in this next season of your life. So that's the big exciting news. And I hope that you are all as excited as I am. And uh, okay, so at this point, we're going to transition into a time of musical worship and teaching. And to help us do that is our friend Laura Ross, a different Laura. Laura is going to read for us our call to worship this morning. It's a passage from the Apostle Paul's um, letter to the Colossian Church. Good morning, everybody. We're going to be reading from Colossians 3, verses 12 to 17. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults, and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. Let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Thanks, Laura, that was awesome. Before we sing together, let's first pray. Good morning, Jesus. Thank you for, thank you for this morning, for this day. Thank you for the way that you've designed your church like a body. Each part matters and has something to contribute. Thank you for a new flow intern, Laura Beth. Would you bless her and bless this dynamic as we move forward? And thank you for each person in this Blue Water family, in this body. We're honored to be doing this kingdom work together. May your peace rule among us. We give you our attention and we lift up our praise to you today. Amen.
at our mooring group on Tuesday evening. And uh, I think our mooring group is probably the best uh, group, by the way. Uh, but anyway, we were talking about the fact that um, we are not owners of what we have. We are managers. God is the owner. Everything that we are, everything that we have, everything that will ever be uh, comes from God and is entrusted to us by God as a gift to be used, invested in ways that are in sync with his plans and purposes. And um, so this, this idea of us as stewards, as managers, and God as owner, well, there's a, there's a kind of a go-to parable in the scripture, and it's in Matthew chapter 25. And we're going to spend uh, some time looking at that today and next week. Uh, so Matthew chapter 25, beginning at verse 14, I'm going to read it. I'm going to read this whole parable and I'll make some comments as we're going through. If you have your Bible in front of you, uh, that would be uh, just really great. Matthew 25 verse 14. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey. And it is referring to the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Jesus. If you glance way back to verse one, you'll see that that's what Jesus is talking about. And so he continues that theme of explaining what the kingdom of God is like. So again, it, the kingdom of God, will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. So notice here that this is his wealth entrusted to the servants. And uh, in the first century, this was not an uncommon thing. It was uh, not an uncommon thing for wealthy landowners who had a lot of money, had a lot of land. They would have a lot of servants. And so they would go on a trip, maybe uh, for business, maybe for pleasure, but they would entrust money to their most trusted servants. And their expectation would be that, that they would gain more money with that money. Uh, verse 15. To one, he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown, and gathering where you have not scattered seed. In other words, I know you're a crook. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. And um, I don't know, it kind of seems to me like this, this one bag servant um, is, is kind of passive aggressive in the way that he is speaking with, with his boss, with this owner. It's almost like, you know, you, you gave me one bag of gold. You gave that guy two. You gave that other guy five. Is that all you think of me? Is that all you think of my ability? Is that how much you trust me just to give me one bag? Fine. Uh, here's your bag of gold back. I think there's maybe a little bit of that kind of passive aggressive thing going on here. Uh, verse 26. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I was a crook, that I harvest where... I have not sown and gather where I have not gathered seed. Well, since you know I'm a crook, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever has 
will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let me be honest, as I read this parable, even as I read it aloud today, I don't like this guy. I do not like this business owner at all. I find him repellent in, in just about every way. And so here's a problem. If this parable is teaching me about the kingdom of God, then if this landowner, well, if that's, if that's representing what God is like or what Jesus is like, then I'm feeling like I've got a problem because I don't like what I'm reading. And, uh, and you know what? That, I think that's okay. I think it is. I think as, as in all of life, we want to be honest, right? And so when we read something like this biblical uh, parable that Jesus tells, uh, we want to be honest with how it, it kind of makes us feel. And I think what it ought to do is to compel us to really wrestle with the text. Like when we see something that just seems so uncharacteristic of what we know of God revealed in Jesus Christ, and that's the, def that's the definitive picture of God, right? What we see in Jesus, particularly at Calvary. So when we see something that just seems so out of sync or so uncharacteristic, um, I think it ought to cause us to want to dig a little bit deeper and to wrestle with the text. There's a long history of wrestling with God and wrestling with the text. Think of, uh, remember, Jacob and how Jacob wrestled with God and God actually changed Jacob's name to Israel because he wrestled with God. That's what Israel means, uh, wrestles with God. And, um, you know, there, there's other instances where, you know, heroes of the faith, some of the ones that we read about in Hebrews 11, they would, when they saw something that they felt was uncharacteristic of God, they would call God out and say, what's going on here? Or if they felt like God wasn't kind of holding up his end of the covenant uh, type thing, they would be quick to, to call that out and to wrestle with that. So I think there's a long history of uh, wrestling with the words of God, wrestling with God himself in some cases. And so I think it's okay to to read a text like this, this story of Jesus, and go, you know what? I don't like that. I got to dig a little bit deeper. And uh, this is true of many texts that we come across. And so uh, I'm, I'm guessing you, like me, as you think about this landowner, um, there's a lot not to like about this guy. I don't see him as being very Christ-like. You could almost get the impression from reading about this guy that, I don't know if you ever saw that 80s movie, uh, Wall Street with Michael Douglas plays this character, Gordon Gecko, just a money loving, uh, ruthless kind of character who says things like greed is good. This owner seems kind of a lot like that. Um, you know, greedy, ruthless, wants his money invested. And if you don't measure up with the returns while well, you're getting kicked out and, uh, into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. I, you know, I sometimes wonder, um, like with a parable like this, I try to put myself in the position of, of an unchurched person or a, or a non-Christian person. How would they perceive God? How would they perceive Christianity in reading a parable like this where, you know, they might think that it's about, okay, uh, Christianity is about producing a 100% return. And if you don't read, uh, reproduce that kind of result, then you get kicked out of the club. And, uh, you know, salvation seems like, okay, it's based on our productivity, perhaps. Um, you know, maybe somebody who's been out of church for a long time might read this parable and say, oh, you know what, I kind of remember, like, what happened to the stories of God's grace and God being loving and giving that freely right up front. Like what happened to that? I thought I remembered that as part of the story. And, and it seems like, uh, I, I, I remember a verse somewhere, perfect love casts out fear. Well, it seems like there's all kinds of fear uh, in this story. It seems like if this is a God character, it seems like he's motivating people with fear. Um, and so you can come to all kinds of wrong conclusions about this parable and preach. I don't know if you've heard sermons, on this parable before, but man, all kinds of preachers have done all kinds of things uh, with this parable, kind of doing all kinds of manipulative things um, 
on the basis of a passage like this and coming to a lot of really screwy kinds of uh, conclusions. Well, it's so important when you confront things in scripture that, as we said, seem really uncharacteristic of God, the God who is revealed in Jesus, when we come across things that just seem out of sync with that, particularly Christ as we see at Calvary, um, and particularly when these things are coming from the mouth of Jesus, right? We've got to stop and say, okay, uh, maybe I'm not understanding something here, or, uh, you know, what's going on? There's, there's something going on here that I'm not getting, and it, it ought to cause us to want to dig deep in the text. I kind of think that God intentionally puts some really difficult things to understand in the Bible so that we'll wrestle with it. Because I think in some cases, wrestling with the text and not like not just water skiing across the top, but actually scuba diving and going deep and, and wrestling, I think sometimes that's where we really come up with the gold, like the, the real nuggets and, and our understanding is enhanced and uh, our wisdom grows and our relationship with God deepens. And uh, so let's, let's wrestle with this text just a little bit uh, today. One of the problems I think that we have with this parable, and not just this parable, but really all of the parables that Jesus told, is that we really don't get parables. We don't really understand how parables work. And for good reason, like we don't talk in parables anymore. So we don't really have a lot to do with this genre of, of uh, storytelling or literature, this thing of parables. And so we don't have a lot of tools. Like when we come to try to interpret a parable, you know, our, our little toolkit is kind of empty in terms of tools to help us know how to interpret it. And uh, so we can come up with all kinds of weird uh, interpretations and some preachers uh, do that. But the thing with parables, um, you know, what Jesus does is he'll take something that is a commonly known reality. So something that is just a commonly known thing with his first century audience, something they'd be very familiar with. And so he tells a story based on something very familiar, something that's kind of everyday life, that's familiar to his audience. And the, the story itself that he tells is just, is just a prop to make one point. So every parable uh, essentially has one point and the story that is being used to tell it is, is really kind of inconsequential uh, because there's one main point that you want to get. And the, so really, in a sense, the story doesn't matter. He's just, just the point that he's making is really what matters. The, the rest of the story just supports the point. It's a little bit like jokes. Um, so on, on, on Tuesday night, I mentioned my mooring, uh, which I think is the best mooring. Um, I asked them, I said, do you guys know any jokes? Because I'd kind of like to tell a joke or two in this uh, sermon today to help uh, illustrate how to, how to get parables. And uh, so a couple of them told a couple of jokes, neither of which I'm, I'm, I feel free to use uh, today. So I thought, okay, I'll try and tell a joke here. And uh, because I spent so long as a Baptist and my whole family is Baptist, I love telling Baptist jokes. So let me, let me uh, try on a Baptist joke for size. How many Baptists does it take to change a light bulb? The answer is 10. One to change the bulb and nine to reminisce about how great the old bulb was. Pause for hysterical laughter. Um, so you're not gonna get that joke unless you know how jokes work, right? So you'd, ha you'd have to understand the stereotype that it has been kind of rightly or wrongly associated with Baptists who are perceived as not per particularly enjoying change or being changed. So you'd kind of have to know that, that that's the punchline, right? Every joke has a punchline. Kind of the, the rest of the joke is just there to support that punchline. Like if somebody listened to that joke and said, oh, well, that's, that's unusual. Why would Baptists have committees of nine to evaluate light bulbs? Why, like, wouldn't it be less wieldy to have a committee of five? Like that would be the wrong, you're not getting it, right? You're asking the wrong question. Or, you know, if people were to say, oh, well, that's interesting. What brand of bulb was that uh, that was being changed? Um, you know, wrong question. Uh, you got to understand how jokes work. It's not about 
It's not about the size of the committee, right? It's about, it's about the stereotype of Baptists that don't like to change. Uh, let me try another light bulb joke just in case that, in case you need another one. So here's another one. How many counselors does it take to change a light bulb? Well, the answer is one. But that light bulb really has to want to change. Pause again for hysterical laughter. Now, to get that joke, you've got to understand something about counseling world and that it is just a, a widely accepted uh, fact that people who are successful in counseling, uh, who, who experience good outcomes, have a desire to change. That's the joke. Uh, so if somebody listened to that joke and said, oh, well, what is a counselor doing changing a light bulb? That seems like a weird part of, of a job description or, um, you know, how is it that a light bulb could want to change? You know, like asking the wrong questions, you're not getting it. All of that stuff is inconsequential. The punchline is that, um, you know, you got to want to change if, if you're in counseling. You're not going to have a good outcome unless you really want one. Um, or, or like this super old joke that you've all heard a hundred times. Like a horse walks into a bar, the bartender says, hey, why the long face, right? Uh, we've all heard that one. And so, and, and the punchline, and to understand that, you've got you've to know the stereotype that bartenders are like these armchair counselors. And when so that somebody comes in looking kind of forlorn, they're very likely to say, hey, you know, why the long face? Um, so if you listen to that joke and thought, oh, well, that's weird. Why would a horse be going into a bar? Isn't there some kind of a bylaw that would prohibit that? Or, you know, why is the bartender talking to the horse? Does the bartender somehow think that that horse can talk? Horses can't talk. Um, so, you know, you're, you're focusing on the wrong things. Every joke has one punchline. The story to get there is inconsequential. And that's kind of how parables operate too. They've got one, I don't want to call it a punchline, but we can. They've got one punchline, one point that's being made. And the rest of the story is just a story that would be familiar with that first century context to get the point. Um, like for instance, last week we were in Luke chapter 11. We didn't look at the whole chapter. One of the things that we skipped um, was a parable that Jesus told about, it's about prayer. And the point of the parable is be persistent in prayer. But the way he tells it is he takes a story that really was a very readily known kind of situation that would have been um, part of that context. And he talks about, you know, somebody, uh, somebody like three o'clock in the morning, they got a knock on their door. They go to the door. It's a friend. They haven't seen this friend for a long time, but this friend needs hospitality. And so in the first century, hospitality was just hardwired into the DNA. It would be unthinkable to turn uh, anybody away from your door, you would welcome them in. Uh, not only that, but you would feed them. And so in this story that Jesus tells, the audience would be, oh yeah, sure, we understand that. But in this case, this host has nothing to feed this guest, and that's unthinkable. That's a huge no-no. So the host uh, runs next door, now it's like 3.15 in the morning, goes and bangs on the neighbor's door, uh, just relentlessly saying, I've got company, I need food, I need three loaves of bread. Can you give me three loaves of bread? And so the neighbor is sound asleep and he wakes up and he's like, get out of here. Do you know what time it is? I'm in bed and my kids are sleeping. Quit banging on my door, get lost. And so this, this uh, host who's frantic without food just keeps banging, keeps banging, keeps nagging, keeps knocking, keeps asking, I need bread, I need three loaves of bread. And finally, this neighbor gets so fed up and so frustrated, um, fine, here's your three loaves of bread, now shut up, go home and quit bugging me. And so this is, this is a parable that Jesus is telling about prayer. If we don't know how parables work, we might think, oh, okay, well, the way to pray is just continually pester and nag God, kind of like Sheldon Cooper in Big Bang, you know, knock, 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 penny, knock, 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 penny, just persistently 
uh, doing that. So maybe that's the way to pray. And God is this grouchy, kind of uncooperative, surly deity who really doesn't want to hear from us, really doesn't want to give anything. But if we're just persistent in our nagging, finally, he'll give us what we want just to shut us up. Those would be very wrong conclusions um, to take away from this uh, parable. Um, and so um, here, here, here's, here's the thing. Um, Jesus is simply telling a story that his audience would be familiar with. And the, and the point comes in, in the phrase that's in that parable, uh, ask and it will be given you, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open to you. In other words, be persistent in prayer. It's not a parable telling us what God is like. It's not a parable about, about neighbors or how to be a neighbor. It's simply that, a persistent uh, prayer is what is being sought after and taught in that particular uh, parable. That's the point. And uh, so it is with this parable that we're looking at today in Matthew chapter 25. And it was a really common thing uh, for you know, wealthy landowners to uh, have a lot of servants and to take a trip and to entrust money to them and to expect them to make money with that money they entrusted to them. That was a really commonly known thing. And um, it was also commonly known that if the servants didn't make the money that was expected, these landowners could be pretty nasty. And, and Jesus doesn't even comment on that. That's not the point. The story that he's telling is just a prop to get to the point. And the point comes when Jesus um, kind of uh, tells about interacting with that first uh, servant in verse 21. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. There's also in this particular parable kind of a flip uh, side to that. And that comes into play when, when um, in verse 29, when this uh, play it safe servant uh, is kind of confronted for whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have even what they have will be taken from them. And so this is really a parable. Uh, this is not about God. This is not a parable. Uh, it's, it's about us, right? It's about us and how we're to live, how we're to think about the gifts that have come our way. And you could sum it up like this. You will find joy when you take the gifts that you have received and invest them in the lives of other, others. That's the pathway, pathway to joy. And the flip side of that, if you take the gifts that you have received and just cling to them tightly or, or, or bury them in the ground and not pass them along, that's a road to misery. That's the point. That's the point of this parable. Uh, so whenever you look at a parable, you want to get to the point and not get caught up in the the story itself, which is just kind of a inconsequential vehicle to get the point across, something that was uh, really understandable to the people in that first century context. And so what we want to get to um, in this parable is, is what does this mean for us? What does it mean for me? What does it mean for you? What does it mean for Blue Water? How does it apply? And so we want to, we want to talk uh, more about that next week as, as well. And I do want to let you know at this point that next week I am going to come with a big ask. Um, and I'm not going to tell you what the big ask is today, but what I do want to ask you to do this week, would you pray? Would you pray um, and ask the Holy Spirit just to help, help all of us uh, for next week, just have our defenses lowered? and ask um, that we'd be able to hear his voice, because I think we'll all have a response to this big ask. So keep that in mind, that's coming up uh, next week. But before we finish off today, I wanna to cover just a couple of points. Um, and point number one is this, it is really important. Can't even stress how important this is, that we have an understanding that everything that is positive in our lives is a gift from God. Everything that is positive in your life, everything that is positive in my life is a gift from God. Think about some of the positive things in your life, some of the good things in your life. And think about some of the other people who don't have those positive things that you have in your life. 
uh, you know, you're, you're at home, um, presumably, watching this video. And if you are watching this on your TV or on your computer or your phone, that means your eyes work. And there's a lot of people whose eyes don't work. If you're listening to, uh, to me right now, uh, it's because your ears work. And there's a lot of people, their ears don't work. If you're sitting there and you notice that your coffee cup is empty, you could hop up and uh, go and get a refill. You've got legs that would do that. Well, there's a lot of people who, who don't uh, have legs that would enable them to do that. Um, if you're watching this as it has gone live um, Sunday morning at 9.45, it's probably now somewhere, I don't know, 10.20ish uh, or whatever. And uh, maybe you're kind of planning a nice big breakfast and you've got enough food in your kitchen for a nice big breakfast. Maybe you've even got enough food for supper, maybe even enough for the week. Well, there's a lot of people who don't have enough food on hand for their next meal. Maybe you've got several changes of clothing in your closet. Lots of people don't. Um, let's say you were kind of really irritated with something that was taking place in, uh, in municipal or provincial or federal politics and you felt compelled to write a letter to the editor. Uh, well, you can, you can go ahead and do that. You've got, you've got the rights and the freedoms to be able to do that and you're not gonna get thrown in jail. Um, not everybody has those rights and those freedoms to be able to do that. At our, at, again, at our mooring group on Tuesday night, as we were talking about these things, we did a little exercise, just kind of a deep breathing exercise where we took in a deep breath and then we let it out. And before we took the next deep breath, we said, let's recognize that our next breath comes as a gift from God. That's the only reason why we have a next breath and a next breath and a next breath and a next heartbeat. Uh, it's because these are gifts from God. Everything positive in your life and mine is a gift. Have you ever stopped to wonder, why is that? Why do you have those gifts and why do other people don't? Like, what is the explanation for that? Is it like you were, you, you were just wonderful in some former life and so you've come back now and everything is really great? Well, no, because we're Christian and we don't believe in reincarnation. So uh, clearly you didn't deserve it. Um, you didn't do anything to get it. It's, you've just got it, which means it's unmerited, it's undeserved. I guess you could say, well, you know, I was just lucky because I was born in Canada. And you know what, there's some truth to that. Uh, maybe you've been to some places in the world that where there's a lot of poverty. Um, I've been to like places like Haiti, where there's just a lot of poverty. And um, my wife has been to Haiti three times. Some of you have been multiple times. Beautiful, beautiful people, resilient, strong. But talk about a people who have faced just an, a, a relentless onslaught of difficulty and, and tragedy and, and um, their capacity just to summon up a, the will to survive is remarkable. But I've got a lot of things, a lot of gifts that I have simply because I was born in Canada and not born in Haiti. And the, the Bible kind of even goes a little bit further than that. Uh, for instance, in John chapter 3 and verse 27, it's John the Baptist who's speaking in this little section here, and he says these words, a person does not have anything that they haven't received from God. A person does not have anything that they haven't received from God. Everything you've got is ultimately from God. James, who is the brother of Jesus, puts it like this. James chapter 1, verse 17. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Uh, I memorized that in King James at one point in my life, and I think it was something like every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. No variableness. This is the invariably good God who gives invariably good gifts, and he, he's always bringing good into the world. And so um, with that come all these gifts that we receive and he never shifts he's invariably good and so everything that you've have is that is positive and that is good well you know what you ought to just thank god for it because it comes from him if it wasn't for god you wouldn't have that you wouldn't have that good stuff 
Now, that is not to say that good things do not come by way of other means. Uh, for instance, if you just look in the mirror and you just think, oh man, I am so cute. You might want to thank your mother because you got your mother's nose and not your father's nose. Imagine if you had your father's nose, uh, you wouldn't be quite so cute. So you can thank your mother that you've got her nose. Or if you've got a brain that just functions like really well, you're really smart. Well, you know what? Uh, not everybody has a great nose and not everybody's brain functions really well. So if your brain does function well, Again, you can go and thank your mom because she didn't smoke crack every day that she was pregnant with you and, and somehow bring damage to your brain. Your brain works well. You can thank your mom. Uh, or maybe, you know, you've got like a job that's just a great, great job. You love your job. It pays well. The people are great. And um, but a lot of people don't. You know, a lot of people don't have a, a great job or a job they like or they're working for not enough money and maybe in really, really difficult circumstances. But you've got a job that that is really great, but you might not have it if the last boss at your last job didn't write you that glowing recommendation. Right. So maybe you can thank your old boss a little bit or, you know, you might say, well, I went to school and I worked really hard to be able to do this job, but you didn't educate yourself. Uh, you received an education and it just might be that other people kind of helped along with that. Maybe even your parents helped pay for that education. So there's, there's so often uh, thanks that can be kind of spread out. But you know, all of the education uh, and, and all of the recommendations in the world probably wouldn't help you if you were born in Haiti and not in Canada. That alone, being born in Canada brings thousands of benefits with it. And I think what James, the you know, brother of Jesus is saying, and what John the Baptist is saying is that we wouldn't have any of these gifts. We wouldn't have any of them if it were not for God. If you read the words of the apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter six, that's a chapter where he talks about, um, you know, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities and powers. And it's, it's like Paul is is uh, describing this scene like the earth has this kind of dark blanket over it, but it's invisible to us. And he's reminding us that our fight is not against flesh and blood. There's these principalities and powers, um, dark forces whose agenda is to steal and to kill and to destroy. And so um, any goodness that shows up is because God breaks through these dark clouds, through this oppression, and he gives gifts. He showers gifts. So every good gift ultimately comes from God. And, and to kind of complicate things even more, um, human beings have free will. So human beings can thwart the plans and purposes of God. So God can, can bust through the, you know, the, the invisible darkness of principalities and powers and bring his invariable good, uh, invariably good gifts uh, into this world. But they've got to be met by some human agency that is cooperative with his plans and purposes. And that certainly is not always the case. There are so many uh, people in this world who are opposed to the plans and purposes of God. And, and because of that, it might seem like God is, is kind of random in the way that he distributes good gifts. You'd almost think God sits up in heaven going, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Oh, I'll give good gifts there. But it is way more complex than that because, you know, you've got, um, you've got people uh, and um, who, who don't always cooperate with the plans and purposes of, of God. And so ultimately, if it wasn't for God and if it wasn't for his goodness operating in this world, we'd be in total darkness and misery like all the time. So thank God for every positive thing that you've got. And thank other people who are the means through which you've received that, because that means that there have been people who have been cooperating with the plans and purposes of God for blessings to land on you. The second thing uh, that I'll mention just uh, before we close is this. When God's good gifts reach you, they bless you. They bless you. And God loves to bless us because he's a good, good father who loves to bless his children. He delights in that. But we must remember that these are gifts that he has entrusted to us. Entrusted means they're not ours to own. They are ours to manage. 
uh, they are entrusted to us. God trusts us with these gifts and we are to um, use them you know, for the purposes for which they're intended. And uh, so every gift that we receive from God is not ours to own, but it is ours to manage. It's entrusted to us. It comes with a purpose. It comes with a responsibility. And, and the responsibility that this parable is about means that we take these gifts and we invest them in others. We m multiply the gifts, we spread them around. And so maybe you, you know, maybe you've got 10 bags of blessings, uh, 10 bags of, of good gifts, blessings that come your way. First of all, just enjoy, enjoy the good blessings of God but also know that God's purpose in giving that to you is so that you'll open up those bags and you'll start pouring out those bags to, to spread that good around and to bless others with it. And the promise of Jesus in this parable is, is that if you do that, then you'll have more to be able to be generous with. Um, it multiplies and our capacity for generosity will grow. Uh, and, and, and as this uh, grows and unfolds in increasing measure, increasingly we'll enter into this joy-filled um, space where God is just um, delighted. It's the delight of, of God. And this mindset, um, if we take it seriously, is really radical and it, it completely bumps up against what I would call the Canadian dream, right? The Canadian dream is basically this, that your life is your life and you're the boss of your life and it's your life and you call the shots and you live however you want and you're the decision maker of your life and your time is yours and your talents are yours and, and the purpose of your life is for you to get whatever you want and to enjoy it. It's yours. You've got a right to it. Can't be taken away. You've got a right to pursue happiness. You've got a right to enjoy your rights and your freedoms and all of that, it's all yours. And I would say this, that that is a good law. And I suppose if I were making laws in a nation, I might make a law like that and think that that is probably a good law. And legally speaking, I think it is a good law. In fact, you know, I Googled the Canadian dream because I've heard of the American dream, right? But I, I, I never knew if we had a Canadian dream. And this is what I found. The Canadian dream is having the freedom to be yourself and to make your own decisions concerning your beliefs, your life, your love and happiness without discrimination or retaliation. So there it is. That's probably a very good law. But biblically speaking, not legally speaking, but biblically speaking or theologically speaking, that is not true at all. It is patently false. In fact, it is so false, I would say it's antichrist. Because the truth is this, your life is not yours. It belongs to God. He has entrusted it to you. He has entrusted my life to me. Remember in the parable, the master gave whose wealth? His wealth uh, to the servants. It was still the master's wealth. He entrusted it to the servants so that they could invest it according to the, to the purposes of the owner, uh, invest it in others. So your life is not your own. Your time is not your own. Your money is not your own. Your talents are not your own. Your skills are not your own. Yes, by all means, enjoy them as a gift from God, but recognize that these gifts come with purposes and responsibilities. It's not yours to own. It's yours to manage. It's yours to invest in, in others, to spread that blessing around. God has gifted you so that you in turn can be yourself a gift and pour out gifts to others. And that absolutely is radical and completely flies in the face of the Canadian dream, as I mentioned it just um, a little bit ago. So we're out of time. So what does this mean for me? What does it mean for you? What does it mean for Blue Water? And uh, we'll come back to it next week. Would you just pray with me? Father, we confess today that you are good, invariably good. You are the giver of every good and perfect gift and everything that we have and are and ever will be comes from you. 
It is received by us as a gift from you, not ours to keep as owners, but ours to manage in ways that are in keeping with your purposes. And you want to bring blessing through us to others who don't have what we have. And so, Father, I pray that as we uh, even process this in Holy Spirit, would you just kind of press this into us? And as we come back next week and pick up with, with more of these thoughts, God, would you just give us a, um, a real sense of how you want to use us individually, our families, and our church family going forward to see your kingdom built in us and through us in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. See you soon. Hi, me again. Thank you so much, Chris. And thanks to each of you for sticking to the end of this morning's service. We are going to close with one more worship song, but first I just wanna share a quick note, something probably should have mentioned last week, but it somehow slipped my mind. This past Thursday evening, our board met for our first annual general meeting, our first AGM. And just wanna let you know that the information that was processed there will be made available to you later this spring. We want to create space um, to share that information in a helpful way and create space for comments and dialogue. In the meantime, if you have any questions or comments, you can reach out to anybody on our board and our board chair, Jonathan, his information is on our website. That's www.bluewater.church. So if you don't already have his email, you can find that there and get in touch with him. Um, in the meantime, hope that you have a wonderful, wonderful week. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Let's sing.
can hide.